Hi everyone and welcome back to Homegrown the Live Show where we talk all about growing food at home to live a bit more of a sustainable lifestyle. I am back after a week off. I was sick and I had nobody does this for me so I had to take a bit of a break but I'm back. I'm feeling refreshed and I'm excited to jump in today's episode which is going to be all about perennials and annuals and how I'm balancing those in my garden. We are also going to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane and I'm going to share photos from my garden um, when I first started. We're going to start from scratch when I had done nothing to the gardens and then sort of how I developed and designed my gardens and what that sort of process looked like and how it all went so um let me know where you're tuning in from i'm so excited to be back and connecting with all of you and let's find out what's happening in the garden so uh it is like i said raining which the gardens are absolutely loving i haven't had too much rain so i think this is going to really give all the all of those plants a really good boost that they needed um and the leafy greens are going to love it for sure so um oh, it's so good to see some familiar names popping up in the live chat if you are listening to this uh as a podcast then i do host this every wednesday night live and it's always so good to see everyone turning up and having their own conversations in the live chat so if you do have any questions throughout this episode make sure you put a cue in front of them and i will do a bit of a and a at the end of the episode um but yeah what else is happening in the gardens i'm i am uh, the pond project is coming along nicely so i am waiting to show you that i'm going to do a little bit of a big reveal and show you the process how i started from scratch with that so that is coming along um what else is going happening well um i'm harvesting some guavas some lemonades and i've started uh, a few mandarins as well They're still a little bit sour, but I kind of like them like that. So I have been harvesting a few, but those will probably be in the next week or so. I'll be getting a whole lot of mandarins. They do have a lot of seeds in them though. So if you've got any tips on what I should make with them, because they're kind of a little bit frustrating to eat, uh, having to pull seeds out of every little uh, individual segment but regardless of whether i'm eating them fresh or doing something with them i'm gonna have to do that so um yeah if you've got any suggestions for mandarin recipes let me know um and our plant of the week is something that you may have seen on my socials as well and that is the hawaiian guava so this one is now fruiting in my garden it's what i've been eating a lot of this week and uh it's something that i've been really waiting for it's quite a slow starter so compared to my other guava trees i had um maybe one or two i think i had like you know a couple each year but nothing really significant and then this year is the first time that i've really had a um good harvest so i've been harvesting like a few every day and there's still quite a few at different stages there's even some really small ones so it looks like the process is going to be a little bit drawn out which is great I'm not getting them all at once like the fijoas they just came thick and fast so i will be able to enjoy these and not feel pressured to eat them but these have a real tropical flavor i've been trying to think about how i can describe that flavor and i think it's Definitely kind of like a Fijoa in the fact that it's quite perfumey and um, yeah, it's got that real guavery, perfumey flavor. And then it also kind of tastes a little bit like strawberry and apple. That's that's the way I've found it. If you've tried it, let me know what you think it tastes like because I always find it so hard describing um, new flavors because uh, they have their own unique flavor. But you can eat these really crunchy and um, they're kind of more like an apple. Or if they're left to ripen, they're very soft and juicy, uh, more like a guava. Um, And I actually am preferring them crunchy, just eating them like an apple. They do have very, very hard seeds inside. So you've got to 
be careful about those. Don't bite into one of those seeds. Um, I feel like that would break a tooth. They are heavy producers. So once they get going, these are going to produce a whole lot of fruit on each plant. Um, high in vitamin C, they are evergreen. They do lose their leaves a little bit in the winter. Um, but the leaves are also a great substitute for green tea. So I have dried some of these leaves and used them in teas. Um, and yes, yeah, like a, another alternative to having green tea. And these will be more of a tropical, so, subtropical sort of climate. So if you do um, not live in those, you may not be able to grow this one very successfully unless you have some um, greenhouses or something like that. Um, but that is my plant of the week, the Hawaiian guava or tropical guava. Um, let me know if you're growing it because it is kind of a little bit unique. Uh, and I love just cutting into it or breaking into it and just seeing that color inside. It's just something that really is quite special. Um, but let's talk about annuals and perennials because these are the main things that we are growing in our edible gardens. And so I just wanted to quickly break down a little bit, um, I guess of some definitions around what perennials and annuals are. So annuals are things that we grow for a single season and these are what we're most used to growing so or eating um, from the shops in terms of lettuces, tomatoes, zucchinis, um, just all of those really um, common vegetables. These are annuals, you grow them, you harvest them and then they're removed. The other one I've got in here is biennials so they can sort of grow for a season or two and are and then usually you'll be harvesting the seeds and stuff from them so some of the things I have is like rainbow chard I'll often do that there's a there's a whole bunch of different ones that you can end up getting for a, for a few seasons um, and then I'll start collecting the seeds from them the perennials are things that are growing for longer than that so things that are growing for two, three, four years, 10 years, or even longer. So those are your real investment pieces in the garden. They take quite a bit of patience, but once they get going, you just get more and more food each year. So co some common ones are, I guess, your fruit trees, uh, asparagus, rhubarb, um, artichoke. Those are all things that will continually grow um, and sometimes they die down completely uh, in winter and then they'll just pop back up without you having to do anything. So these are some some of my favorites because I just love a low maintenance garden. I love things that just grow and I just get to harvest and eat them and not have to um, spend too much time babying them. So we're going to dive into that and uh, I guess how I've uh, designed my garden around annuals and perennials and where they sort of fit in. Um, so perennials are really my one true love. I, and I'm going to jump into annuals and let you know what I love about them. But perennials are something that really excite me. One, I love fruit. So of course, that is probably one of the reasons I love perennials because I love fruit trees and those are something that once you get going, you, you just get huge abundant crops from them. And over time, you just get more and more food. So these as well, like I said, you plant them, they just regrow on their own or they do require some maintenance, obviously, in terms of pruning them and feeding them and things like that. But they're a lot more set and forget, I guess, than our annuals. They um, can provide a stable, consistent food supply. So one of the things that I'm going to share later on in this episode is how I'm starting to food map and plan out when things are fruiting and when things are ready so that I can fill in any of those gaps throughout the year to provide more of a consistent food supply from my garden. And because these things grow back each year or fruit each year, you kind of get to know when that's happening. Um, and... They've, they're always there. So whether your annuals die or you have a really bad crop of tomatoes or you get storms and or frosts, those perennials are usually a lot hardier and usually going to 
be able to provide that food when we are struggling with, with our annuals. They create lots of diversity in the garden. They are, I call them investment pieces for the garden because you pay for them once and then you don't have to continuously purchase them. So um, I find them very economical. They provide more and more food each year, most of them. And um, the other great thing about having these plants already established in your garden is that they usually are a lot more drought tolerant or a lot more um, hardy with weather conditions. Especially here in Perth, one of the struggles that I had right back when I first started my gardens is that it's so hot and dry here and we have sandy soils. So it's it's pretty much impossible to be growing annuals without doing any amendments to the soil. So the thing that's great about perennials is that they have time to get their roots established, to get their roots deeper in the soil, which keeps them cooler, which uh, allows them more access to nutrients and water. So they end up being uh, a lot more, you know, drought tolerant and um, I guess, yeah, hardier. They can help with stabilization of soil and erosion. So if you have um, slopes and things like that, if you get your, your perennials in, they'll help hold that soil and help that topsoil from running away so that you can start planting in your annuals after that with that good base of perennials. They also will then grow to provide shade, provide wind blocks. You can really use them to your advantage to create little microclimates in your garden. That way, when you do want to be planting your annuals, you may have some screening up already or you may have some wind blocks and shade. So you can really start to get quite strategic with planting of your perennials. Um, and they are great habitat for our wildlife. So but the fact that they're there all the time, they're creating homes or little houses for our wildlife and we're not ripping them out each year and causing our wildlife to be homeless. So that the, that's one of the great things. Like we can really start to create some wildlife in our garden, some um, beneficial insects, some, you know, little lizards and things like that. So that's going to help with our natural pest management if we have uh, all of these beneficial insects and wildlife in our garden and giving them a, you know, safe environment where they've got things to hide in long term all throughout the year is going to really help with that. And they also support no-dig gardens. So no-dig gardening is something that I do uh, where I don't go in and till my gardens or dig my gardens up and like put fresh uh, plants in. Everything that I'm doing in my garden is layering on top uh, so that I'm not disturbing the microbiology and the soil too much and drying it out because that is something that I really don't want to do. I want to keep as much moisture in the soil as possible. So uh, by not having to pull all my plants out all the time is another really, really good way to help support a no-dig garden or support my soil, especially with having such <laughs> sandy, crappy soil. So uh, those are some of the reasons why I love perennials, and I feel like I could go on all day about that. Let me know what ones you're growing. Um I also am starting to sort of substitute some of my annuals for perennials in terms of like flavor and I guess some like some similar vegetables and like maybe potatoes. I've got the Queensland arrowroot, garlic. I've got the society garlic where that provides me with those types of food kind of all year round rather than uh, having to rely on the annuals. There's nearly substitute for many things like you know you've got perennial spinach we've got perennial basil uh they've got different types of spinaches and different types of um herbs those are all great things that are going to offer us flavor and food all year round uh but there is a definitely benefits to annuals as well so they they are they can't be forgotten there's um so many benefits in terms of 
being able to get food quickly. So annuals, you don't have to wait years to get a harvest. They are up and ready to go. You know, radishes are four to six weeks. We've got um, leafy greens like lettuce. Those don't take much longer, six weeks, eight weeks, bok choy. And the other things we can start harvesting a little bit from as they grow. So I harvest the leaves off my broccoli to sort of make room for other things so that if they are overshadowing. So I'll use leaves off my broccoli and my cauliflower as they're still growing. So you do get a lot quicker access to food by growing annuals. And annuals are something that we tend to start with when we first start our gardens. Um, because, you know, we're excited. We want to grow food that we can harvest. We don't want to wait for you know, three years, five years for that fruit or that vegetable to finally get established enough to, for us to harvest it. So they are really, really good for getting a garden started. They, you have so much variety and that's something that I love. I love growing variety. I love growing different types of uh, vegetables. I like growing different colors. I like trying new things every year. So having that option available with these annual vegetables is something that you know I love and it keeps it exciting it keeps you wanting to continue gardening so um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about getting creative with the garden design and not getting bored when it comes to my specific gardens and I do have lots of examples of the photos from start to finish they're also Annuals are easy to cook. These are things that we know. These are things that we're used to, you know, tomatoes, zucchinis, lettuce, their pumpkins, watermelons, like they're things that we're much more familiar with. And so we're more likely to use them. Whereas perennials, I mean, obviously fruit is a perennial and so are, so are herbs and things like that. But some of our more unique perennials are a little bit more... I guess, unfamiliar, and we're going to have to experiment with them a lot more. So I have been adding one or two here and there and really trying to explore that. But, you know, the classics are so much easier to cook with. And again, this one also promotes diversity, that we can grow a whole bunch of different things and attract different uh, wildlife to our gardens with lots of different flowers and vegetables and another thing that I love about annuals is the ongoing learning because I'm constantly growing new things and annuals tend to have lots of issues that's what I found like you know every year I have something else new wrong with my tomatoes or my zucchini or I find new bugs or new um, weird leaves or there's just always an ongoing learning process when you are growing annuals. And that's really, really valuable to, to, to learn from experience is the best way to learn because it really does um, embed into your mind. And if you've had some big failures in the garden, that's really the best way to learn. It's how you can think about not doing it again. Or if you have no idea what went wrong, you can research it and find out you don't know why the leaves are this color or you don't know why there's weird veiny colors or something like that. You can really start to expand your knowledge with growing all these different types of annuals. And you can think you've got it all sorted. And then, you know, the next year, there's a whole new set of things to learn and climate issues because, you know, every summer seems to be completely different to the previous summer. So you've got um, you've got different bugs appearing, you've got different things happening. So there's it's probably like, it's actually really interesting that we start off with growing annuals and then that's one of the, you know, easiest ways to learn more about gardening. So it does really make sense to do that. Um, and then we can practice saving seeds because we're getting seeds a lot quicker in terms of, you know, things go to seed within one season and, you you can really start to see whether you got things right or wrong pretty quickly within a season, within a few months, rather than waiting, you know, years for these things to start producing and then realizing it, you've done something wrong or the soil's not right or, you know, they don't like 
that much shade or they don't like that much sun or, or they're not getting the right conditions to actually fruit. So you get a lot more, I guess, quicker uh, results and quicker learning curve with the annuals. And then you're producing so much more organic matter. So having things cycling through, you know, your, your zucchini's coming to an end, your tomatoes coming to an end, your pumpkins coming to an end. You've got all of that that can go into the compost to create organic matter. And because you've got all different types, you've got a lot more diversity and nutrients going into your compost that then is in turn going to create really diverse, healthy soil to grow more stuff the next year. So it's a really good cycle. The more diversity you can grow, the more diversity you can put into your compost. And then it's just a really great sustainable cycle to continue to do. Um, but let's, should we take a look at where it all started? So just a little bit of some background on my gardens. Um, I purchased this house as my, this is my first home and I didn't plan on being here long term. So uh, like many of you probably, I have dreams of having, you know, land and being out of the city and really being able to create this abundant homestead or uh, have big food forests and things like that. But for your first, you know, home, your first property, that's not always within the budget. So we bought this place and I thought, you know, optimistically in a few years time, I'll be moving on to my dream farm. Well, <laughs> that's not really reality. So um, here I am still I'm still here. So it did start quite slowly. I didn't really invest a lot of money and time into uh, the gardens here because I did always sort of plan on moving. And my plan was to move countries back to New Zealand. So I, it wasn't like I could purchase fruit trees and then take them with me to the next property. I, I'm, I mean, I would love to have put those fruit trees on a plane to New Zealand, but I don't think they would have uh, allowed that. So I was really reserved at the start in terms of what I did with my gardens, but I still like had to plant stuff. I had to plant stuff. So I'm really glad that I did. I'm really glad that I still um, went ahead and planted things. And it's just been a slow evolving space over time. And really in the last couple of years, I've gone more all in, I guess. And I'm getting a lot more perennials and a lot more fruit trees being that I'm here and still here. So this is uh, my backyard, my urban food forest style garden. It started uh, when I first moved in. There was one fruit tree, which was the lemon tree in the corner. And then we there were some grasses, um, some kangaroo paws and things like that. And this was already a garden bed. So I was like, this is perfect. I'm going to get started. I was given for my birthday that year a bunch of fruit trees. So I didn't even um, pick them. I just was gifted them. Uh, so I was pretty happy with that. Um, I think my, yeah, my partner bought them for me. And he thought he was buying guavas, which turned out to be Fijoas because here in Australia they call them pineapple guavas and so he had no idea he was buying me Fijoas but that just worked out perfectly because I was stoked. So I then put the two Fijoas either side of the lemon tree and I do have photos of this up so if you are just listening to this you can always pop over to my YouTube channel and check out the video version with the photos and the Fijoas are tiny 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 and one of the main reasons that these feedjoas are so tiny is because my dog was just a puppy and he absolutely mowed them all down so he ran through those gardens at full speed and all my little newly planted fruit trees were cut off at the base which was devastating um just not long being planted and they're already completely cut off but they bounced back um and they have been growing ever since so I started out with my perennials I started out with these fruit trees 
And obviously over time, these are going to get bigger and bigger, but whilst they're still, you know, so small, there's so much gaps in between them. There's so much more space to garden. So that's where I went in and started planting lots of annuals, uh, lots of quick growing crops like uh, tomatoes and capsicums and um, watermelons and um, all sorts I was planting in between these fruit trees just to utilize that space. So whilst I was waiting for my fruit trees to grow, I could start getting some food. I could start harvesting from my garden. Um, and that's something that I now do in all of my gardens. So when I'm establishing any new gardens with perennials, I'll always go in and just like fill them up now with heaps of annuals to utilize that space whilst I'm waiting. Um, so the, the spaces started to get smaller and smaller, obviously, as the fruit trees got bigger. And I was running out of space to grow all of my annuals. And I really just wanted more gardening space. I was, you know, you know what it's like. You just get so excited and you want to be able to plant more things, but you have no room. So that's where I sort of took it to the next stage and getting my container garden set up. So these container gardens, I we built them out of um, pallet planters. They well, pallet, pallets, um, and the heat treated pallets, not chemically treated pallets. And this gave me instantly so much more space to garden. I had them on wheels. So these are on a driveway part of my property where it gets really, really good sun, but I didn't want to rip all the pavers up and put in gardens because we were planning on not being here that long. So um, this was a perfect, and I think if you are renting, this would be another really great option is to have container gardens and to have, um, you know, something that you can move around. So this is where the kitchen garden started. And I planted a lot of quick growing crops, a lot of things you can just grab one or two leaves off. So lettuces, spinach, rainbow chard, some chilies, um, herbs, celery, all those sort of things, and then start you know, putting some structures up to grow vertically, to grow peas and beans and um, all those sort of things. And so this was just so exciting. This is so much more room to grow now that my uh, fruit trees were completely taking up all the space and I was like not able to plant all the things that I wanted to plant. So the next stage was I just didn't have room to plant those big things. So the pumpkins. Pumpkins take up a lot of space and you can climb pu pumpkins over so many things. So you can grow pumpkins vertically, which is great, but I, I still had quite a lot of space. So that's where I created the pumpkin patch, which is a super shallow garden. It's built on a driveway again. Um, and the great thing about pumpkins is that their roots are also very sprawling. Just like their, their vines on the surface, their roots are also similar to that. So I was able to grow those without having deep garden beds. These garden, This garden bed is, I don't know, maybe max 15 centimeters deep. It's very shallow, very hard, compact ground underneath. There is no way you can dig down. I tried, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> and that was not going to happen. So... Um, this was the perfect place because if my pumpkins ran out of room, they could go off down the driveway and, um, it worked out perfectly. This spot gets, um, a lot of sun in summer, but in winter it does get a lot of shade. So that's, again, what I was doing is observing where all the sun and the shade was in my property to really maximize those places and figure out where I can plant things. So it worked out great. I wanted a space to grow pumpkins. Pumpkins grow over summer, over spring, summer, and they're ready in autumn. So the pl the fact that this garden had great sunlight over the that time worked out perfectly. Now that it's winter and, you know, I, I don't have much need for it anymore, I'm going to be trying to do either co cover crops or I think... 
I'm just going to let the New Zealand spinach grow wild at this point too. Just cover that soil, protect that soil, and uh, that's going to give me food over the winter months as well to then really utilize this again in spring and summer. The, the next stage was more fruit trees. I wanted more fruit trees, so I went with citrus. Citrus are uh, quite an easy thing to get started with. They tend to be a lot hardier, they tend to have a lot less bugs, and they just, I don't know, they love full sun, and I had a lot of full sun. So sun was not something I... <laughs> had an issue with so I planted some citrus out the front and this was my idea was to screen off and create a edible hedge again just like out the back but this time with citrus um, citrus are evergreen so they're going to be lush all year round I didn't have to worry about uh, having gaps when their leaves were falling off and then the next stage after that was really I was going through a whole lot of different stages where I um, was getting, you know, I went from being not having enough space to then having so much extra space with these kitchen gardens. And um, I took a pretty big break, I think. There's a, I don't know, I actually, I'm not very good at years. You guys don't ask me when, when things are, I'm always <laughs> forgetting, but um, once I had most of this garden established, you know, I was pretty set for a while and uh, the perennial, the, my love for perennials sort of started to take over a bit and I um, started putting more perennials into different garden beds and um, yeah, I just felt like I was running out of room again. So a few years later, I ended up with the raised garden beds, beds in the front yard. And this is where I really just want to focus on annuals. I feel like that's where I can get creative. It's where you can change things. It's sort of like your canvas for painting is every season you can grow new things. Every year you can mix it up. You can really just start afresh. Um, and so it gives you that opportunity to be a lot more creative, to not get bored with anything because you always have the opportunity next season to do something else uh, with your annual garden beds. Whereas the perennials are kind of set and forget. And once they're established, they're just going to continue to grow and you don't really have much room to be changing things up and you know putting more plants in. So having a dedicated annuals patch was something that I really wanted. And that is where I've gone in the front yard with these raised garden beds. And I found raised garden beds have worked really well for me. A lot of people ask me why raised garden beds, do I need them? Uh, the reason I've got them is because I have no soil. I have pure sand. Uh, it's really, really hard to grow anything in it. And so I need to be able to either dig a lot of that out and put good soil in or go up and have these raised beds where you can put all the good soil in to get started. So that's that's the only reason I have it. There's no right or wrong reason to just have a vegetable patch versus having raised garden beds. Um, and the, yeah, they've gone through their own evolution, I guess, with the shade structures now come have come off and I'm gonna be working on getting some more shade structures put up with some living shade so my plan for these raised garden beds is to put up a more of a permanent structure to grow grapes on and that's going to allow me to have some shade over summer when I really need it when my these my annuals will just really struggle over summer because they have you know shallow roots like we were going over before they're only just planted in the garden they they only just newly established so they can't handle all of that hot Perth sun. So having shade is really important for me in my garden, but I want to that shade to be producing food too. So we're going to be doing something yeah, pretty soon with that in terms of maybe some grapevines that will let light in in winter when I need it and provide more shade in summer. But that's going to take a while for that to establish. So just like my food forest style garden with planting my perennials, I'm also going to be utilizing the annuals to really get some quick shade up next summer 
So I think what I'm going to be doing is planting again the bottle gourds or some, I've got the choco as well. Uh, any other climbing vines I might be able to be putting up over that to get me that really quick shade and also provide food whilst I'm waiting for the grapevines to get established. And um, yeah, lots more things happening out there. We did start the Food Forest 2.0. So in between my citrus trees now out the front of the gardens, I have planted more trees. So I've planted more fijoas in between there, another guava. And I'm now going to be starting to fill out the in-between stages, just like out the back where I have different layers with my fruit fruit trees. I have middle layers. I have little shrubs. I have edible flowers. I have ground covers uh, to really make a lush, you know, full. It's very full. There's no gaps, which is what I'm wanting to create out the front as well. So that's another work in progress that's happening at the moment. I'm just sort of waiting for things to establish. I'm transplanting from different areas of my garden so that I don't have to get new plants because I've already got quite a lot of plants now. I can start splitting things up and moving things about. So as well, again, just like we've talked about with when I started my first garden, I'm planting annuals in here as well. I've got some kale in here. I've got, um, you know, I've planted some other edible flowers. I think I put some pansies in and all sorts of stuff. So I'm just really starting to utilize that space a lot more than what it was before to um, just create more diversity to create, to really cover that soil and trying and attract lots more beneficial insects to my garden. I think that's something that I'm just really working on at the moment. I've, I'm, wanting to I've seen the benefits of of what that does of how that affects my garden by having more pollinators by having more beneficial insects to manage the aphids and things like that so seeing that I just want to attract more so more habitat for them more food for them by having flowers more the wildlife pond which is coming along so that's something that I'm working on at the moment is just really uh, creating cozy houses with lots of food for my beneficial insects. So I guess now that leads us to the harvests from these different style gardens. So we touched on how uh, our annuals provide a really good base, I guess. They, they're just like easy. They're easy foods to cook with. You can make salads, you can make soups. They're just, you know, a lot more... You don't have to think about it it's so much. You can just use them. So having a combination of the two is is really, really good because you can you can have that easy go-to, but then you can also start adding in some of those different style greens, some of those different um, perennial spinaches, the perennial lettuces and things like that, the herbs, um, and start to really experiment with it. So as you can see now, my harvest baskets are always with both perennials and annuals. I have fruits. I have, um, yeah, the New Zealand spinach. I have the annuals with the lettuces or the rainbow chards. I've got the sweet potatoes, which is another perennial. The um, Queensland arrowroot, another perennial. And it's just, yeah, it's just exciting. I get to try all these different things. Um, and a lot of these things are things that you don't see in the supermarket. So it, or so sometimes it can be hard to know if you like them or not. And I think that's another really important thing, especially when we're talking about fruit trees is it's, it's hard. I don't know. Like if you've never tried them before and I, I do worry about that with a lot of people, what, you know, watching my channel and seeing what I'm growing and wanting to plant them. And I'm like, I hope you, I hope you like them because it's such a subjective thing. It's such like, um, everyone likes different th fruit. Everyone likes different flavors. Some, you know, my partner doesn't like fijoas. So I think that's weird, but so I'm always like, I hope you can try them first. But then the other hard thing about this is, is that they don't taste the same as at the shops. So, I mean, if you've 
bought feijoas before at, a, at, a, at the shops, they don't taste the same as if you grow them yourself. Because, because they continue to ripen off the tree, they get very overripe, they... Um, yeah, they just taste completely different. And the same, I guess, with a lot of our fruit that it either gets picked when it's not quite ripe so that it can it can handle being, you know, shipped about or moved. So farmer's markets are definitely your go-to trying to find some more interesting food that is grown locally and then also is picked at the right time and not picked early and not picked and left to go completely overripe. Um... But yeah, it's a tricky one. Some of these things I had never tried until I grow them. So if you don't like it and you've just spent, you know, a few years growing it, it can be a little bit, you know, disheartening, I guess. So where you can definitely try things. Um, and that's where like local swap meets and things like that are great. You always get to try what other people are growing in the garden and um, try new things. How can you not five acre farm? How can you not like feijoas? I know, and I had so many feijoas this year, and I was like, he he did actually grow, grow to like them. I think he just, I mean, he's a kiwi as well, so he should like feijoas. But he did start taking them to lunch, and he was enjoying them. And I actually, I just made a feijoa slice yesterday, and uh, he loved that. Went down so well. So, you know, like a Fijo crumble slice or so delicious or Fijo crumble at all, you know, you can't stop. So, um, what do I got here? So in terms of planning and design and food mapping, it's a little mix of everything, really. It's, you know, you want to start out, grow those annuals so that you can get some quick food you want to grow those annuals so that you can learn more and you can really start to experiment with things and get creative with things but then you can start putting in your perennials your fruit trees and planting around them as well and the other the other perennials like your asparagus and things like that those are things that are going to take time so I have started adding in different all and basically all of my gardens now I do have a mix of perennials and annuals because if you are feeling overwhelmed if you start a garden with annuals and you start to feel a little bit like you're always behind you you have too many seeds to plant you are never getting enough time in, in the garden you you know you're not getting any food out of it because you're you're too busy there's too many like it's it's just getting overwhelming that can be a really good sign to step back and have a think about it and maybe add more perennials into your garden design because perennials are things that are so low maintenance once you get them established so that is what happened with me I went all in with the perennials after a while that I had such low maintenance gardens I tell you like I only had to water them and harvest them and feed them. And that wasn't enough for me. I was like, I need more like space to be planting. I need more stuff to plant. So it works the other way around. If you are feeling overwhelmed, that maybe you start switching out some of your garden beds to have more perennials in there so that at least you've got some, some things growing. So if you, if you just do not have time or you just don't have the mental capacity for it, you've got too much going on or something, at least the perennials are tracking along in the background and you don't need to be so stressed about it. Because I know a lot of people have been reaching out to me saying, you know, oh, it's too late now. I'm not planting anything for winter because I just, you know, and I, that's completely normal. Like I get like that as well. But if you do have those perennials going on in the garden, you know, they're just going to keep going, ticking along whilst you're, um, waiting for the next season to get, you know, re-inspired or have more time or something like that. So that's one way. And then also the other way is like, if you have all these perennial gardens, but you don't have like the space to be creative and you want to try new things and you want to change it up and you, you get a little bit bored. So having it, a dedicated annuals garden can also be great for that. But what I have started doing is just popping a few perennials in 
my annual garden beds and my raised garden beds just so that I never have to start from scratch. Every garden bed always has something in it at all times. So whether that's herbs, whether that's perennial spinach, whether that is um, society garlic or something like that, I've just popped those in my raised garden beds and in my kitchen gardens. So even if, you know, there's absolutely nothing else in there, there's at least some of those perennials ticking along. Um, and then you can start filling in the gaps in terms of where you're lacking, I guess, in food supply. So if you start tracking when your fruit trees are uh, fruiting, which is what I'm doing at the moment, I'm sort of writing down when things are fruiting. So like right now I've got the guavas, the lemonades, I've just had the feijoas. Um, next up we've got the the mandarins, the blood orange. Um, what else have we got? The kumquat is going to be not too far away. My lemon tends to fruit all year round, so I'd never have to worry too much about that but I did give it a haircut so it doesn't have too many lemons on it at the moment um and then the same with the rest of your vegetables if you like for me I really struggle to grow in summer it's my hardest time of year to grow so what I'm wanting to do is now create some or start looking for some perennials that I can grow over summer so that I do still have plenty of food available that's even if my annuals aren't working out so another one is like the in-betweens of seasons. So asparagus is ready in the spring when our winter stuff has finished and our summer stuff hasn't quite taken off yet. So that's a really good one to bridge that gap, to have that food available when we're sort of finishing up winter and we're waiting for summer. So having things like that where you can like fill in the gaps is going to be a really, really great to provide more food consistently all year round and obviously that depends on your climate because if you do have really cold winters and you can't grow things or you do have like me really really hot summers and it's also a struggle so it does depend on your climate but you can really start to get um quite strategic with it all once once you've got things established and that comes with time this is my gardens have been a work in progress for I've been here eight years now so to me like it's been so slow it's been very gradual but that has meant that it's sustainable long term because I've each garden sort of has its own um, systems now so I'm not having to now that I've got you know quite a lot of gardens on the go now I've got the urban food forest I've got the kitchen gardens the raised garden bed the pumpkin patch the food forest 2.0 the pond garden windows garden soon I'm going to have the, the arbor that's like there's a lot of gardens going on here and if all of them were high maintenance I, there's no way I would just be like I don't have time for this so by setting each one up before moving on to the next one made it so much easier and so much more low maintenance for me and I, I never feel overwhelmed um, and the fact that I have perennials in all my garden beds I never feel behind or that I'm stressed about, you know, getting all my annual seeds in because I know there's something. There's something in all of those garden beds that's going to continue to grow and provide me with food. So, um, yeah, if I've got any real tips, it's like start small and really try and master that garden bed before before moving on and um, – going all in in all these different areas with different things because it is it is it's really hard and I struggle with it I do want to do all the things and I think you guys probably have seen that as well with um all the projects that I want to have on the go but I am trying to uh do one at a time and not jump <laughs> around too much um but yeah I hope that's helped you if you've got any questions let me know I'm gonna answer a few now um five acre farm what preserves have you made with the feijoas I haven't made any preserves yet with the feijoas so this was my really my first year of having the biggest harvest I've had and I gave quite a lot away I have a lot of kiwi friends which um 
I finally have been able to give those away to people that have been like, oh my God, Fijo is so, that was great. And then uh, I froze quite a lot because I want to have them throughout the year because they came so quick and fast and there's only so many I could eat fresh. So I just wanted to try and preserve them by having them fresh, uh, by having them frozen to then use in other things. Uh, I've made two now just because I had to perfect the recipe, which was what a shame I had to have two. Um, Fijo crumble slices. So those were delicious. And what else have I made? Oh, I blended some up for, for, for Fijo like juice or smoothies, which is one of the, my favorite ways to have them. And I still have some in the freezer, so I can still make other things with them. But next year, I'm hoping I'm going to get a good season again. I mean, it's not guaranteed that the Fijoas were very different this year because we had such a dry summer. I actually have some photos of them. When you cut them in half, they were quite, there was a hollow hole in the middle. And I had a look at what that was online and it turns out that's from lack of water. So I'm not surprised at all that that, that, that happened because, you know, we had such a dry summer. So um, hopefully I get a whole bunch next year and I'll be able to do some more creative things. Like I would love to do some bottling of them. Um, you can make like Fijo liqueur or I don't know. There's so many amazing things that we can make with them or Fijo jams and chutneys. Oh, that's one thing I did make. I did make a Fijo skin chutney. So because I, I had a massive bowl full of all of these Fijoas that I was um, scooping out the insides for, I didn't want to waste all of those skins. So I did turn those into a Fijoa skin chutney. Um, and that turned out pretty good. The only thing is, is I put red chilies in it. And I probably wouldn't do that again because the red chilies kind of made the coloring go a pinky color. And the, so the color is not that great, but it tasted good. Um, and... I feel like that's all that matters. <laughs> so yeah, Fijoa skin chutney and frozen Fijoas and Fijoa slice and lots of fresh Fijoas. Um, they were delicious. Uh, what else have we got in here? Love growing artichokes, asparagus. What else have we got? Um, started to get so dark now. I can't even believe how, like it feels like it's midnight. Um, and I know that if you're watching from New Zealand, it is, it is pretty late. Um, but I think that's pretty much all the questions we've got here. Oh, I, this, you know, so many people having conversations in the, um, in the chat. It's so great. I love that. Thank you guys so much for showing up for, for having a chat with me. And um, I hope that you found that useful and I will see you back next week with a, another episode. And if you do want to do something to support this channel, I would absolutely love it if you love this podcast to give it a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I don't think I have any reviews yet. So um, you could be the first one and I would really, really appreciate that. So thank you guys so much. I will see you back next week for another episode.